So it's the overview and clinical correlations of lugolib. Now, uh, even though you know you don't have to know all the cutaneous uh, nerves supplying the skin of the lower limb, certain cutaneous nerves are clinically important. So you see many nerves here, many cutaneous nerves. Uh, so you don't have to know the names of all these cutaneous nerves, you know, stories about them. Okay, but certain ones are important. One such nerve, if you start from the upper end, is lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh or lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So instead of thigh, you can use femoral. You don't use usually both. Okay. Uh, so it's either lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh or lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Uh, so this nerve actually, uh, even though it's drawn like this, it comes, uh, now if, I, if, if I remove the skin here, I will see that it comes out, uh, it comes uh, under the inguinal ligament towards its lateral end. And then, uh, you know, it appears, you know, in the lateral upper corner of the femoral triangle. Okay, actually you can put it as a content of the triangle also because it comes under the inguinal ligament. Uh, now the issue arises there when it comes under the inguinal ligament here, uh, it can get compressed under the inguinal ligament. When it gets compressed, then you get uh, uh, altered sensations uh, and pain in the anterolateral aspect of the uh, thigh. Okay, so that condition is called neuralgia paresthetica. Okay, so it, it is surgeons, you know, release it uh, under the inguinal ligament. It's a small surgery, I think, under local anesthesia. They can release it under the inguinal ligament and uh, that can actually help. Then, you know, before you do go for surgery, there are drugs, there are several uh, oral uh, treatments that you can uh, try. So those details are not necessary at your level at all. Just remember that this nerve, uh, even though it's a small nerve, cutaneous nerve, can get compressed under the inguinal ligament, then you can get this uh, pains and altered sensations of the um, anterior lateral aspect of the upper thigh, uh, which is called meralgia parasthetica. There's another name for that. You can see it here. Uh, the common name is meralgia parasthetica. Okay, so that is one. Number two, saphenous nerve. Now, saphenous nerve, uh, we have... Uh, you have encountered this name several times. Now, this is the only nerve that uh, comes into the leg uh, as a branch uh, of the femoral nerve. All other nerves are given in the thigh and they are uh, used up in the uh, thigh. So the only nerve, which is a cutaneous nerve, saphenous nerve, it doesn't supply any muscles in the leg. Uh, it comes through the adductor canal and uh, it uh, pierces the, uh, the, I think the roof of the adductor canal. Um, and uh, it, it does not pass through the popliteal fossa, it does not enter the popliteal fossa. Uh, before the adductor hiatus, it leaves the uh, adductor canal and uh, it, uh, it uh, accompanies the great saphenous vein. Okay, it accompanies the great saphenous vein. Immediately in front of the great saphenous vein, uh, it comes all the way down into the uh, foot area. Actually, it supplies the, uh, this area of the foot, medial aspect of the foot, saphenous nerve. Okay, um, so that is one point. Then the other point is, important point is, uh, since it is very closely related to the, uh, the, the, the great saphenous vein, uh, very closely related to the great saphenous vein, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a small surgery in that area. You can cut the skin and open up the great saphenous vein, which is called venous cut down, the great saphenous vein at the ankle. Uh, now, during that procedure, I'll, 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 I'll summarize that procedure to you. Um, later, uh, then in that procedure, actually, uh, you give local anesthesia, you give injections here, local injections uh, with lignocaine and block this nerve, block this nerve and, and during surgery, when you open up again, you will find the nerve so that I will tell you later. So for that reason, saphenous nerve is uh, important. Okay. And it supplies this area of the leg with uh, L4 uh, segment. Okay. Then the next one. Is the superficial peroneal nerve. Now this superficial peroneal nerve, you know the, uh, uh, the sciatic nerve. Again, I'll show you how the nerves divide into branches. Superficial uh, peroneal nerve is a branch of the common peroneal nerve and it supplies the lateral compartment of the leg, that side of the leg. Uh, what are the two muscles in the lateral compartment? Peroneus longus and peroneus brevis muscles. After supplying the, um, these two muscles, lateral compartment muscles, uh, uh, there's a cutaneous part of that nerve remaining, uh, it uh, enters the, uh, it, it, uh, it appears in the lower part of the 
uh, leg it pierces deep fascia and comes to supply the skin so it supplies the dosum of the foot here supplies the dosum of the foot uh, so that is one point that you need to remember I'll, I'll combine the two points here then if you go to the deep peroneal nerve deep peroneal nerve is the nerve of the anterior compartment of the leg and uh, just like the superficial peroneal nerve after supplying the anterior compartment of the leg and uh, the muscles of the dosum of the foot here okay after supplying these it uh, it has a small cutaneous component which actually supplies the first wave oops which actually supplies the first wave take it down which actually supplies the first uh, wave here okay it's disturbing my view okay um, so then you know uh, you know that you know the, the common peroneal nerve is uh, related to the neck of the fibula at that point and if there's a fracture of the fibula a nerve can get damaged or in certain positions the nerve can get compressed against the neck of the fibula in such conditions there can be temporary paralysis of muscles if it is the common peroneal nerve both the lateral uh, compartment and the anterior compartment muscles will be uh, paralyzed if it is only the deep peroneal nerve you will only get paralysis of anterior compartment muscles you know this i think uh, then you get foot drop but associated with that why these two nerves are important this cutaneous supply is important is that if it is common peroneal nerve you will get anesthesia of this you might get okay sometimes you might not uh, anesthesia of the whole uh, area but if it is only the deep peroneal nerve you will only get foot drop and uh, you will get this anesthesia or you will get anesthesia of only small area in the <clears throat> first wave okay so these pictures you know you might not see exactly the same picture because uh, the the nerve whatever the nerve injury or thing can be you know uh, 100% you know or can be uh, percentage you know, not complete loss can be partial okay then depending on that you will get different pictures okay so this uh, this is only in theory we mention it like that okay then the sural nerve uh, sural nerve uh, it is the nerve that supplies the the, the posterior um, skin on the posterior uh, surface of the leg uh, now that nerve uh, you can see it uh, behind the lateral malleolus i'll come back to it later now why sural nerve is important is that now in certain conditions um, usually you know you you know that <coughs> you know what is a biopsy you take biopsies of organs you know when you suspect cancer or any other any other disease that you want to uh, diagnose uh, after sending a specimen to a pathologist looking at it under the microscope if you want to diagnose the condition uh, need not you know always be cancers you know even other conditions you take a biopsy but usually you don't take nerve biopsies okay because once you take a biopsy from a nerve then uh, you will have a loss of sensation no loss of function muscle contraction in an area so usually you don't take nerve biopsies but in case you want to take a nerve biopsy okay you cannot help uh, without taking a nerve biopsy then uh, this is a nerve that you can use for biopsies okay sural nerve okay not very often okay don't go and say that you do nerve biopsies in, on sural nerve but uh, but uh, you know i have seen you know people there, there was one guy who was doing um, research on gillan barre syndrome you will learn this syndromes later it's a peripheral nerve disease now there he was actually uh, doing sural nerve biopsies on uh, on on those patients uh, that's you know combined with this research but anyway you know the, the point there is that you can use it for biopsies okay then uh, this uh, femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve you are not familiar with the name of this nerve uh, this is a nerve that you find when you uh, dissect the inguinal canal here when you do the anterior abdominal wall you will you have, uh, at anterior abdominal wall you will dissect uh, the inguinal canal so you will find this uh, uh, genitofemoral nerve in that uh, canal then then you do the abdomen and then you go to the posterior abdominal wall uh, when you do the posterior abdominal wall again you will uh, find uh, these nerves in relation to the posterior abdominal wall muscles so this genitofemoral nerve it has two components genital component and femoral component so the femoral uh, part of the genitofemoral nerve is it supplies this area okay so when you do procedures in in that area when you give local anesthesia and block actually you block this branch this is specially when you do procedures on the femoral vein I'll, I'll again you know come back to it okay 
Then you see another nerve here, either inguinal nerve. It's same thing I have to tell you. Uh, it's, it's also a nerve that comes through the inguinal canal. So you will find it coming through the inguinal canal when you dissect the inguinal canal with the anterior abdominal wall. And again, you find it in the uh, posterior abdominal wall. Uh, then the either inguinal nerve, uh, also it has, you know, um, a little bit wide area of supply here. It supplies the medial aspect of the thigh. So when you do procedures on the upper end of the, uh, the, the great saphenous vein, you will have to, when you do local anesthesia, actually you block this nerve. I mean, there can be overlap, you know, you might be blocking uh, all, all these branches, you know, just have an idea about it. Okay, that's all I want you to uh, do because otherwise, you know, when you read textbooks, you will not understand. Okay. Um, and the other thing is the ilo inguinal nerve will supply uh, the genital um, organs, in, at least the anterior part, you know, if you, if you take uh, in, in a female, uh, this, uh, you get the mons pubis area, if these are the lower limbs, so that area is supplied by the ilio inguinal nerve. Later on, you know, when you do the perineum and all, you will understand that the pudendal nerve supplies that area. Ilio inguinal nerve supplies this anterior area. Uh, so, uh, okay, we will not go into details now. Okay, so, because all, all these things are related. Okay, whether you do upper limb, lower limb, or, you know, perineum, there are related things. Okay, then uh, a few other points. If you take the medial malleolus, right, as a bony landmark. Uh, now, from what you have learned so far, you can uh, recap now. Anterior to the uh, medial uh, malleolus, you get uh, uh, saphenous nerve in front and great saphenous vein behind. Okay. Then posterior to the medial malleolus, uh, you get the posterior archway, uh, an important, clinically important tributary of the uh, great saphenous vein. So that is one thing. Then on the other side, if you take the lateral malleolus as the bony point, uh, in front of it, you get the superficial peroneal nerve, uh, and behind it, you get the small saphenous vein and the sural nerve. Okay. Then the subcutaneous structures related to malleoli, so the same thing. Okay. So you can see this image, you can see the, uh, the saphenous nerve and the great saphenous vein uh, nerve in front of the uh, vein. Then in this diagram, you see the, uh, the sural nerve, branches of the sural nerve, actually it comes and supplies the lateral aspect of the foot here. Just like the saphenous nerve supplying the medial aspect here, it supplies the medial aspect, sural nerve supplies the lateral aspect, then the superficial peroneal nerve supplies the, uh, the dorsum of the uh, foot. Then the, the procedure that I promised to um, show you, this is the femoral vein catheterization. For certain medical procedures, you will have to send a catheter through the femoral vein, uh, especially towards the heart. Now, to do that, you have to uh, get an entry point for the uh, catheter. Now, for that, actually, you can use the femoral vein below the inguinal ligament in the femoral uh, triangle. So, not that you have to know these procedures, uh, nobody will ask you how to do this, okay, it's, it's a long way for you to learn these things, you will only do, you will only do this uh, as maybe as registrars or senior registrars if you go into special fields, but not even as um, pre intern house officers, so you don't have to know it, but you should know the anatomy behind it, okay, so that's, that is the part that you learn here, so have a basic idea about this description rather than, you know, trying to learn the description and by heart it and you know write it in an answer we will never ask you the procedure okay remember that point and now then you know one point is when you give local anesthesia for this procedure it is mainly the uh, the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve that you're blocking so that is one anatomical point that you know i wanted you to uh, at least you know appreciate then the femoral the what what you do is you you look for you feel for femoral pulse you feel for femoral pulse putting your fingers there okay you feel for femoral pulse at the mid inguinal point. Now it says femoral pulse palpated midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis. So the midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine, which is here, and the uh, and the symphysis pubis. Symphysis pubis is um, somewhere here. Okay, symphysis pubis is somewhere here. So the midpoint between the two is called mid inguinal point. On the other other hand. Midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, it, the, the two bony points where the inguinal ligament is attached, which you have not learned yet, called mid 
point of the inguinal ligament okay which is somewhere here okay which is somewhere here now this point mid inguinal point is medial to the midpoint of the inguinal ligament you know if somebody uh, wants to check this on you uh, don't get trapped okay so mid inguinal point lies uh, at a point medial to the midpoint of the inguinal uh, ligament for this reason so here the femoral artery the point that you have to remember here is that the femoral artery when it passes under the inguinal ligament actually it passes at the mid inguinal point so you 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 take the mid angle you don't have to measure you can just you know go by your eye uh, the naked view you 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 put your fingers at the mid inguinal point um, against the swiss uh, tendon which is underneath that i'll come back to it later so you press against that uh, then uh, you you can feel the femoral artery pulse so what you do is you go you, you go once you feel the pulse then you know vein is just medial to it so these are all anatomical points okay so you just just medial to the area where you feel pulse, feel pulse you go two finger breadths below the inguinal ligament two finger breadths below the inguinal ligament medial to the femoral pulse and you in, insert the uh, insert the uh, the, cat, the needle of the catheter at that area then you know you do the procedure you have learned so here you know again i am telling you you don't have to remember these procedures okay no one expects you to remember but uh, you you have you have to have this background anatomy knowledge you know, that you will have to have when you one day you know when you do it okay so so what we can you know ask you is we can ask you uh, to to detect uh, you know, to catch the femoral vein you can uh, feel for femoral artery pulse at the mid inguinal point and go medial to it okay so then something like that you know uh, then that's true okay then saphenous vein cut down uh, so this is great saphenous vein cut down which i was telling you in the previous slide uh, there you know why you need to cut down why you need to cut down saphenous vein is that sometimes you know after uh, an accident and severe blood loss or uh, after severe burn uh, you get uh, volume depletion you get a lot of blood loss or fluid loss because of these conditions and by the time the patient uh, is brought to the hospital uh, you might not be able to find all your cephalic vein and median cubital veins and all that okay so all veins would uh, would be collapsed okay could be collapsed by that time then uh, only there are only few places where you can uh, where you can say for sure that okay even though the veins are collapsed i if i if i open up i will see a vein here so you can do it in in central places like you know you you have all these central veins in the neck that you will learn later so those are certain places you can go in for sure but then uh, there is uh, one place that you can be sure almost 100 percent that there is a vein uh, if you go in front of the medial malleolus you will find the great saphenous vein so for that you do the venous uh, saphenous uh, vein cut down so you can see here you give local anesthesia and block the branches of the saphenous uh, nerve here which lies in front of the great saphenous vein then you cut here as you can see here there is a cut uh, and then uh, you open up once you open up you will see this relationship uh, saphenous nerve lying in front of the great saphenous vein so this you know we can easily check in mcq center okay uh, saphenous nerve lies in front of great saphenous vein at the medial malleolus okay so it's true then now you identify the nerve and uh, you protect the nerve you ligate the vein in two places then cut in the middle okay uh, no you don't cut in the middle okay sorry you don't want to remove the vein what you do is you 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 ligate uh, it in two places and you you, you actually insert uh, you don't have to ligate it even you just you just find the vein and uh, insert the uh, the needle into it okay so you you put the needle into it, the cannula and if you want to give you want to give iv fluids or blood or whatever you can give it through that way okay so it's, it's not cutting okay it's putting a needle and giving it the later on later on uh, once you have finished the uh, finished giving the fluids or blood you know maybe after few days you take the needle out and suture this okay your suturing can be done even before and later you will remove this and uh, suture again or whatever okay um, so this is the point that you need to remember here uh, then uh, uh, even though it's not uh, uh, as frequent as uh, saphenous vein cut down at the in front of the medial malleolus you can do saphenous vein cut down at the groin okay at the groin 
immediately before it enters the femoral vein at the saphenous uh, opening. Uh, so there, that is the other point, uh, it is when you block with local anesthesia, it's mainly the branches of the ileo-inguinal nerve that are blocked because you get the uh, uh, genitofemoral nerve, femoral branches supplying there, then the ileo-inguinal nerve supplying in you know, this area, like okay, this whole area, even the scrotal area in that case. So then, you know, when you give local anesthesia, even though you don't have to know, okay, you don't have to know anything about the cutaneous nerves, when you give local anesthesia, you can just give it, okay, now, whatever the nerves that are there, even though you don't know the name, they will get blocked, okay, so that is one thing, okay. Um, then, you you put an incision and then you access the great saphenous vein. You don't have to know you know much about it uh, uh, more than that. Okay. Then uh, a few things about motor nerve territories. Even though you have gone through it several times, I also have done it. I have seen the practical. Uh, now just uh, as a reminder, uh, just um, to recall, remember that the anterior the, the, the thigh has three compartments: anterior compartment, or extensor compartment, posterior or flexor compartment medial or adductor compartment and the nerves are the anterior compartment is the femoral nerve and uh, is the medial compartment is the obturator nerve it has an anterior division and a posterior division so both divisions will supply adductor muscles then the posterior compartment is supplied by the sciatic nerve if you want to be specific it's the tibial component of the sciatic nerve will again you know come back to the components of the sciatic nerve in a different slide okay so these are the um, uh, motor nerve uh, territories um, okay then uh, okay this anterior and posterior divisions okay and the other point is uh, uh, the the adductor magnus the large muscle on the adductor compartment the posterior part of the adductor magnus uh, actually is called the hamstring part of the adductor magnus so that is also supplied by the tibial uh, component of the uh, sciatic nerve not by the uh, the obturator Nerve. So that actually, you know, functions as part of the hamstring muscles. Okay. Then few things about the femoral sheath. I don't know whether I block your view here. Few things about the femoral sheath. Uh, you have learned about femoral sheath. I talked to you uh, about the femoral sheath. It's a funnel shape prolongation of the transversalis uh, fascia of the abdomen and the iliacus fascia. You know this extends uh, about one inch below the inguinal ligament. Now the point here is, I have drawn this diagram before also, it's divided by two septa into uh, three compartments. Uh, laterally, you get the femoral artery, then uh, in the middle you get the femoral vein, and here you get the femoral uh, canal. So I, I want femoral canal here. Now uh, this is femoral canal, okay, this is femoral canal, and in this femoral canal, um, there is a femoral ring, at that point, femoral ring uh, covered with uh, condensed uh, uh, extraperitoneal tissues, which is called femoral septum. So this femoral ring and femoral septum are important. So abdominal contents due to certain conditions can push through this femoral septum through the femoral ring into the uh, groin area, which is called femoral hernia. Now, if you go for the boundaries of the femoral ring, even though you do no certain structures, you have not done the anterior abdominal wall yet. Uh, now, anterior boundary of the femoral ring is uh, the inguinal ligament, the medial part of the inguinal ligament. Then the posterior boundary is the pectineal ligament. You cannot learn any of these things. Then uh, the lateral boundary only you have learned. It is the, uh, the, uh, the medial uh, septum uh, and the femoral vein, you know, with the symptom, you get the vein lateral tree, okay. And then, uh, medially, you get the uh, free sharp edge of the uh, lacunar ligament, that is, you know, uh, it, it, it's attached to the medial part of the inguinal ligament. You will learn all these things when you do the anterior abdominal wall. Now, through this ring, uh, things can herniate, especially in females, okay, because their pelvis is wide and, you know, they get, uh, especially, you know, during childbearing, you know, these things and all, all these things you get uh, sometimes uh, due to high pressure in the, uh, the lower part of the abdomen, contents can come, come through the uh, femoral, uh, femoral canal. Then uh, uh, femoral hernia would look like this. Okay, femoral hernia would look, look like this. Then you get inguinal hernias also in that area, okay, in different places. Then uh, later when you go for your, go to your clinical years, you you, you will have to differentiate between, separate between inguinal hernias and femoral hernias. This is how you separate them. Uh, 
this is the pubic tubercle which you can feel outside uh, the femoral hernias if you feel lies uh, below and lateral to the pubic tubercle on the other hand inguinal hernias will lie uh, above and medial okay below and lateral above and medial so your pubic tubercle is somewhere here so inguinal hernias will be in in that area okay but if you get a hernia here then you will know that it's uh, obviously inguinal hernia okay so femoral hernias lie below and lateral to the pubic tubercle okay if it becomes large it might go in front of the uh, the inguinal ligament that's a different tissue okay so there's time for you to learn these things okay so we'll leave that then uh, ligaments of the hip joint now uh, there are several ligaments around hip joint now uh, one uh, the, the strongest ligament of all is the iliofemoral ligament iliofemoral ligament is like an inverted y like an inverted y and uh, so it's one attachment is at the anterior inferior iliac spine okay anterior inferior iliac spine and the, the, the two limbs of the y inverted y is attached along the uh, intertrochanteric line on the anterior surface of the uh, femur okay and it, it prevents over extension of the uh, hip joint all all the ligaments you know all three ligaments main ligaments uh, around the hip joint they actually prevent over extension or you know extension then uh, the other one uh, is the pubofemoral ligament which is this one uh, it's uh, it's a triangular shape base here lying on the uh, superior ramus of the pubis base lying here on the superior ramus of the pubis and the apex again you know um, is attached to the uh, intertrochanteric line like the previous one uh, it not only prevents extension it uh, over extension it prevents uh, over abduction also okay so movement in that direction is you know checked by this ligament uh, then uh, ischiofemoral ligament uh, is this one ischiofemoral ligament uh, it also limits extension it's attached to the body uh, of the ischium here and the, uh, the greater trochanter here okay uh, so then you other than that you get this transverse acetabular ligament here okay then you get the ligamentum teres this one uh, you can also call it ligament of the head of the femur uh, so it uh, keeps the head in position uh, and the other important thing is you get uh, an artery branch of the obturator artery going through it and supplying the head of the femur uh, in children okay that supply is important in children not in the adult uh, life anymore okay uh, then a uh, few important points relations of the hip joint uh, now the anterior ones are more important uh, i i guess uh, and the posterior of course um, anterior one now the femoral vein if you take the femoral vein femoral artery and the femoral nerve the three structures that you can see here from medial to lateral uh, femoral vein uh, is separated from the, the the capsule of the hip joint which is underneath by the pectineous muscle so in other words pectineous muscle lies between the femoral vein and the uh, hip uh, joint capsule okay uh, then the, the the femoral artery this one uh, lies uh, lies uh, the, the lies above the psoas uh, tendon so the psoas tendon lies between the artery and the capsule of the hip joint okay uh, so the structures uh, related in front of the hip joint if you say it like that you get the pectineous muscle and femoral vein here then the iliopsoas and uh, femoral artery here then you get uh, the psoas and femoral artery here and here you get the iliacus uh, uh, iliacus and uh, femoral uh, vein uh, femoral nerve sorry femoral nerve so you get nerve artery vein so when you feel for pulse here in the mid inguinal point actually you press the artery against the um, psoas tendon okay psoas tendon so if you get the um, yeah i don't have to draw it i think you can understand it okay then you know there's a additional point the bursa uh, separates the iliopsoas from the capsule because it uh, it comes from that area and passes like this okay so there's a bursa underneath the muscle okay that's a different tissue then other relations of the hip joint now uh, superiorly to the hip joint uh, in this uh, coronal section 
you can see two muscles related. Uh, now this one is uh, rectus femoris here, uh, and this one is gluteus minimus. Gluteus minimus and uh, rectus femoris muscles are related superiorly. Then inferiorly, you get the obturator externus. Obturator externus related to the uh, capsule of the joint. Then posteriorly, uh, you see this piriformis muscle, then obturator internus and gamellae, superior and inferior gamellae muscle. Okay. So, I mean, not that you have to, you know, by heart this, but if you, you know, when you study these things, you get a uh, good idea about the 3D arrangement of these muscles around the hip joint. That's why I'm telling you. Then the other point here is that gamellae separates the sciatic nerve from the capsule of the hip joint. Okay. This is the sciatic nerve here. Okay. Then there is another important point. Uh, now, uh, uh, medial, medial to the hip joint, uh, you get the um, lateral wall of the pelvic cavity. Okay. Now, this is the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity. So, so on the other side, laterally, you get the, the acetabular. Okay. So, what I have here written here is medially, the acetabular fossa forms the lateral wall of the pelvis. Okay. Now, the important point here is that uh, uh, you get the ovary in females. Ovary lies in this area. You call it ovarian bed where the ovary lies. Okay. So, and on the other side, you get the, uh, the acetabular uh, fossa and between the acetabular fossa and the ovary, you get this obturator vessels uh, and the obturator nerve. Okay, obturator vessels in the obturator nerve and uh, these are covered by uh, the peritoneum and lateral to these vessels you get the ob uh, obturator internus, obturator internus muscle and, uh, and the fascia covering it. Uh, these things you will learn later. But at least you remember this point. No one will ask you uh, for your uh, current exam, what you are going to get at the end of the first semester. Nobody will ask this, but later when you do the pelvis and, and perineum, uh, this becomes important. Okay, then you can't say that you haven't learned it. Okay, so remember this uh, point. Then the other important thing is, uh, sometimes the, the femoral head, um, certain injuries, uh, femoral head can be driven into the pelvic cavity. Okay, uh, breaking the, now you get the, uh, the acetabular fossa like this, you get the femoral head like this. Uh, this can uh, break the acetabular fossa and enter the pelvic cavity. Then remember that you get the ovary in, inside deep, with the obturator vessels and nerves in between. Okay, so these things can get damaged. Okay, this, this can get damaged. Remember this point. That's why I told you. Okay, then uh, uh, I think I should remove this. Okay, uh, now types of fractures. Uh, now, what is important here is uh, the point that we discussed during the blood supply this lecture. Now, if the fractures uh, are neck fractures of the femur are intracapsular, uh, then there's a possibility like, you know, this one and this one. Uh, if the fracture is intracapsular, then you get the retinacular vessels damaged, okay, which are the main source of blood supply, blood supply to the head of the femur in adults. So if it is an intracapsular fracture, you can get there's a risk of avascular necrosis of the head unless you correct it immediately, uh, surgical correction, okay. So that's one point, but if it is extra capsular, uh, then, uh, oh, you know, this one, then you will not get any problems, especially you remember the, the capsule is attached, you know, halfway, halfway, not halfway, it falls short of the, uh, the intertrochanteric crest at the back, okay, it's attached to the intertrochanteric line here in front, at the back it's different, so that area you will get, remain the blood supply if you fracture it here. Then, you know, you can get um, all sorts of fractures of this uh, bony prominences like greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. They are called evulsion fractures. When the muscles attach to these uh, structures, when the muscles undergo violent contraction, uh, you can pull this, this bony prominence, which is called evulsion fractures. Okay. Then when the neck of the femur is fractured, uh, the limb gets shortened. If you compare the length of the two limbs, you will uh, notice that the fractured side, the limb is shorter and it is laterally rotated, shortened and laterally rotated. Now, the, the reason for lateral rotation is the action of uh, the lateral rotators. 
uh, which are the gluteus maximus, um, piriformis, and uh, obturator internus, and all that, gemella and chondritis femur. They are all um, uh, lateral rotators of the hip joint. So the moment the neck breaks, then they freely uh, laterally rotate the, uh, the distal uh, fragment of the uh, fractured bone. So that is the reason. The other reason is when the person is in the bed, uh, you get this you know, limb uh, getting rotated partly due to the effect of the gravity also. Okay, So that also uh, helps in this uh, lateral rotation. Then the shortening uh, is done by the strong uh, flexors and extensors like rectus femoris uh, and uh, hamstrings and adductor magnus muscle. Okay, uh, So that's uh, one point that because you you go to wards in the third year, you see a lot of you know femoral neck fractures. So this positioning of the foot is there. Sometimes uh, orthopedic surgeons they cover the patient with the cloth, okay, like like a dead body, and you can only see the uh, foot here. And they ask you know what could be the fracture. It's not only neck fractures, okay, even uh, other femur fractures in the upper end can uh, give the same picture, okay. Then. Uh, Upper one third fractures. Um, okay, then you know again you get this you know uh, uh, the two fragments uh, positioned like that. Uh, this is due to uh, iliosphere action. Okay, flexed. Then uh, abducted by the gluteus medius and minimus. They are strong abductors of the hip joint and laterally rotated again by the uh, gluteus maximus. Okay, the distal fragment again you know. Adapted and the leg is shortened, lower limb is shortened, uh, adapted and you know pulled up by the hamstrings and quadriceps. Same thing, okay. And laterally protected by the <coughs> adductors and gravity, okay. The same position uh, will be there. Then, uh, like in the supracondylar fractures of the humerus, uh, in the distal end fractures of the femur, uh, the because of the strong gastrocnemia muscles. You know the gastrocnemia, medial lateral heads of gastrocnemia are attached to this area. So these will actually um, pull the distal fragment and it will bend like this. And this ragged uh, broken end can actually damage the popliteal artery. Now remember your anatomy again here. Uh, if you take the popliteal fossa, you give the, pop, uh, the, 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 the tibial nerve um, most superficially, then you get the, uh, the popliteal vein and uh, so it's the nerve vein and then the popliteal artery so you get the bone here so artery is actually on the bone almost on the bone so when this happens uh, uh, there's a possibility that the artery gets damaged okay just like the, the brachial artery getting damaged in uh, supracondylar fractures of the uh, humerus okay then the gluteal region mm, you have studied the gluteal region. I think you have done the practical also. I will try to summarize a few things here. Uh, one thing is uh, a structure that you cannot forget in the gluteal region is the piriformis muscle before anything else. Okay, because that's the, that's the most important landmark uh, according to which you describe everything else. Okay, then uh, the second point and the other point is that it, it enters the gluteal region from the, uh, the, the pelvic walls uh, through the greater sciatic uh, foramen, greater sciatic foramen, then uh, uh, in the in the inside of the pelvic cavity, it is actually attached to the middle three pieces of the sacrum. Okay, uh, second, third, and fourth pieces of the sacrum, the bodies of the sacrum, it is attached. Then here it is attached to the greater trochanter. Okay, uh, now above the piriformis muscle, you get uh, the superior gluteal nerve and superior gluteal vessels. Then uh, the superior gluteal nerve, which is this one, writing is not clear here. Uh, supply of the artery, we don't mind much, but the superior gluteal nerve uh, supplies the uh, gluteus medius, minimus, and tensor fasciae latae muscles, these three muscles, which are strong abductors of the hip joint. Strong abductors of the hip joint. There's a clinical point. I'll come back to it later. They are strong abductors of the hip joint. If you damage the nerve, if you damage the nerve, before it supplies the muscles, then you get um, these muscles paralyzed. So the abduction of the hip joint is uh, is affected. Okay, so that's one point. Then, um, then you know this uh, uh, superior gluteal artery uh, 
so this is uh, an artery that is uh, involved in the uh, uh, trochanteric canastomosis okay uh, to supply the lower limb uh, when the proximal uh, femoral artery block is there okay so that's a different point uh, then both the superior gluteal and inferior gluteal arteries are branches of the internal iliac artery i think i told you then inferior to the piriformis muscle there are many structures you get the sciatic nerve and the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh and you get uh, the superior inferior gluteal artery and the inferior gluteal nerve inferior gluteal uh, nerve uh, and artery then other than that you get uh, uh, internal pudendal uh, vessels and the pudendal nerve internal pudendal vessels and the pudendal nerve and the nerve to obturate internus which you might not see here so there are several structures uh, in that area you know coming uh, out uh, through the greater sciatic foramen below the piriformis okay so remember these structures when you go for dissections one day try to see these structures when you do the dissection of the gluteal region now some of them uh, if i name them last three here nerve to obturate internus uh, nerve to obturate internus internal pudendal artery and pudendal nerve even though they come out through the greater sciatic foramen below the piriformis they don't enter the gluteal region they go back into the uh, uh, the perineum through the lesser sciatic foramen okay so so you have this uh, ischial spine here uh, the three structures come out and go in again okay come out and go in okay others like inferior gluteal vessels they come into the gluteal region okay Then related to that, uh, this Trendelenburg sign and gait. Now, when you walk, now this is the normal uh, situation. This is the, the problematic situation. Now, in the normal situation, as you can see here, when a person walks, when you, in this case, is the right uh, leg, right foot. When the person lifts the right foot, uh, the pelvis, the, the hip on that area, pelvis tends to fall down. Okay, because there's no support from the leg. That is prevented by contraction of the abductors of the opposite side, the weight-bearing side. The weight-bearing side abductors like you know, gluteus medius, minimus, and tensor fasciae latae supplied by the superior gluteal nerve, they contract and actually what happens is instead of uh, dipping down, uh, the, the, uh, that end, the iliac crest moves upwards a little bit. Okay, So that's the normal walking pattern. Okay, But on the other hand, if on the weight bearing side, uh, the, the abductors are paralyzed. What will happen is when the foot is lifted on the unaffected side, uh, the upper end of the pelvis, so the, uh, the iliac crest area will fall down, fall down like this. And if you, if you ask a patient, if you suspect, if you suspect um, this abductors uh, are not working in a person, you ask the person to uh, bear weight on that side, affected suspected affected side and if this happens the, the the pelvis dips on the unaffected side then you call it trendel and berg sign you call it trendel and berg sign and when a person like a uh, person having a positive trendel and berg sign when the person walks what happens is every time he uh, he bears weight on the affected side the unaffected side uh, the pelvis drops okay so that is called trendel and berg gait then you get a typical gait, no? you know, when, uh, when he bears weight on this side, then there is no dipping on that side. But when he bears on weight on this side, then there is a dipping on, on the unaffected side. So then that is called Trendelenburg gait. Then, you know, sometimes, you know, especially in children, uh, during delivery, sometimes you get bilateral, uh, bilateral um, hip dislocation, bilateral hip dislocation. So even though the, uh, the superior gluteal nerve and the muscles are intact, Muscles cannot act now. The, the, if the two ends are like this for the muscles to act, if there is dislocation, this end will move up. Okay, so the muscles do not have an enough enough length to act on. Okay, therefore they cannot do their uh, function. So then again, you know what you get is even though the nerve and muscles are intact, what you get is uh, the same uh, sign. So if the if it is not corrected when the the, the, the child starts walking, you will get this gait on both sides okay so that is called waddling gait waddling waddling gait that is the gait is like uh, waddling is uh, 
that is the duck's gait. Okay, gait is like a duck. Okay, waddling gait, swaying, called swaying gait. Okay, so either side is dipping, both sides are dipping, meaning walk. Okay, so so all these points, you know, Trendelenburg sign, gait, they are the same. So waddling gait is also there when you get bilateral uh, uh, bilateral problem. Okay. Then few things about the surface marking of the sciatic nerve. Uh, surface marking of the sciatic nerve. Now, uh, you don't do it often, but the surface marking may be important for you to understand uh, the reason behind giving intramuscular injections. Okay. But if we want, as anatomists, we can ask the surface marking. Okay. Even though you don't do surface marking in, in wards and clinics, it's, it's not done. Okay. So it's practically, in a way, you know, it's not very important. But the intramuscular injections are important because you give injections all the time. Either you give or nurses under your observation give. Now, how you surface mark is there are three important bony points. I think this diagram is from maybe from Harold Ellis. Uh, there's very very nice diagram in Harold Ellis. I don't know from where I took this. So the three bony points are the um, the ischial tuberosity here. Okay, the superior surface of the greater trochanter here, and uh, the posterior superior iliac spine. These are the three bony points. So if you draw a line between the posterior superior iliac spine and the ischial tuberosity and divide it, you know, you, you divide it into three parts uh, and you put a dot uh, at the junction between the upper third and the lower two thirds, that is the point where the sciatic nerve is emerging. So you mark one point here, let's see. Then you get the midpoint between the ischial tuberosity and the superior surface of the greater trochanter and you mark that part. So you draw a curved line between these two points. The line should be curved uh, laterally. Okay. So that's the curved part of the sciatic nerve. Then from that point, you draw a line vertically down. So that's one way of doing it. Or what you can do is from that point, you take the midpoint between the uh, femoral condyles, femoral condyles and connect these two points. But remember that nerve divides uh, about your know, hand's breadth just more than hands breadth above the uh, the knee joint line because you know it divides at the apex of the popliteal fossa okay so if you are asked to draw or describe the uh, surface marking of the sciatic nerve remember these points uh, you describe it uh, remember that it doesn't come all the way up to here okay it, it divides before that in the popliteal fossa then based on this knowledge um, okay the other point is the sciatic nerve um, it, it lies, I think I told you, it, it, it is separated from the uh, joint capsule by these muscles, okay, uh, gamellae, obturator internus, quadratus femoris, all these muscles lie in front of it, anterior to it, and separates it from the uh, joint capsule, uh, and um, even the adductor magnus lies in front of it, then posterior to it lies the, uh, the, the biceps uh, femoris muscle, okay, biceps femoris muscle, Lies posterior to it and it divides at the apex of the uh, popliteal fossa. So the sciatic nerve, uh, there can be variations even in your dissections. If you have 15 bodies, at least sometimes you know one or two bodies, you might have these variations. You don't get the sciatic nerve, you know, it, it, the largest nerve in the body, it comes out as one nerve covered with one uh, outer covering. Okay, maybe it's a perineurium, no? perineurium, I think, yeah. So then uh, inside that you get the two components, tibial component and the, uh, the peroneal or the common peroneal component inside this common sheath. Now in certain people, uh, you get the nerve coming out uh, below the piriformis, uh, but the two components come out, you know, close together, but separate. You see them separately, but still they come below the piriformis muscle. That's one uh, way of coming out rather than having a common sheath. Then in certain other people, the peroneal component can either come above the piriformis muscle or pierce in the piriformis muscle, come through it. Okay, come through it. So then, uh, and the other point that is important is usually it is the tibial component that is constant. Tibial component is usually comes below the uh, uh, piriformis muscle, not like the peroneal component. Okay. Um, so this is also an interesting point, even though we don't learn variations too much in learning anatomy. Then you know the branches of the sciatic nerve. It divides into tibial nerve and common peroneal nerve at the apex of the popliteal fossa. Then the common peroneal nerve is related to the neck of the fibula and immediately when it 
immediately after it passes the neck of the fibula, it divides into superficial uh, peroneal nerve and a deep peroneal nerve, superficial peroneal nerve is the nerve of the lateral compartment. Deep peroneal nerve passes to the anterior compartment and supplies the muscles of the anterior compartment and the dorsum of the foot. And both these nerves have a small cutaneous component. Superficial peroneal supplies the dorsum of the foot. Deep peroneal supplies the first wave. We discussed that earlier. Then uh, safe area for intramuscular injections. Safe area for intramuscular injection. Um, it is the upper lateral quadrant. Now, if you if you divide, if you take the buttock, if you take the buttock like this and divide it into four quadrants. Uh, now, the sciatic nerve passes like this, as you can see here. Okay. So, these two quadrants, uh, medial and lateral, lower quadrants are not at all safe for intramuscular injections because the injections are given deep. You get a very thick fat layer here. So, the injections are very deep. So, you can actually damage the nerve here. If you damage this nerve, you will you can get the whole almost the whole lower limb paralyzed because only the anterior compartment only the anterior compartment and the adductor compartment of the thigh are spared okay posterior compartment of the thigh and the whole of the leg and uh, foot will be muscles will be paralyzed if you damage it totally but it can be again you know to different degrees partial you know, to different degrees so then uh, uh, it seems that these two quadrants are safe but on the other hand, you can get variations here, you know, coming, uh, you know, parts uh, above the piriformis. So the medial quadrant is not recommended. Okay. Then uh, what you do is, and you get uh, not only the gluteus maximus, you get uh, not only the gluteus maximus, you get the other muscles also, gluteus medius and minimus in front here. So then you give the injection into this area, upper lateral quadrant of the buttock. Now, other point is, even though you, I, I drew it like this, the buttock, you, it's, it's not recommended to expose the whole buttock. If the person is like this, you take the clothes down and expose the whole buttock. If the legs are like this, it's not recommended. It's very unpleasant. Okay. Uh, so people will not like it. Patients will not like it. So you should have a method uh, to give the injection with minimal exposure. Okay. Minimal exposure. Uh, without even opening that area. Now you can see the buttocks here. If you can do an opening like this, close and give the injection here, it's, it's marvelous. Okay, the, the, the person will, if you are doing a private practice, person will only come to you. Okay, go nowhere else. Okay, so learn that. So this is, there are several methods. There are several methods. Now this is the method I prefer. Mm, you can see the measurements here. You take now, if you are a right-handed person, you take your left hand, uh, the hand that you don't use for the injection, you take that hand, wear gloves, and uh, you spread your five fingers. You you spread your five fingers and put the index finger, put the index finger on the anterior superior iliac spine and the middle finger on the tubercle of the iliac crest. Okay, anterior superior iliac spine and the tubercle of the iliac crest. Then, now between the two fingers, you see this gap. Okay. So you clean that area, always you clean before you give injections, you clean that area with alcohol and give the injection while the hand is still there. Okay, it's very uh, nice when you give the injection like that. Uh, so it's very, you're 100% sure that you don't damage the sciatic nerve. Okay, then uh, if you read Harold Ellis, there's a different description. I don't know whether they use the description again. You take your palm like this. Okay, you take your palm like this and there you put the, the tip of the, of the thumb on the anterior superior iliac spine and the radial border of the hand along the iliac crest. Okay, so imagine you know you put your uh, thumb here and the radial border along that, so you your palm will cover this area with the fingers here. Okay, so the area covered by the palm is the area for the injection in that maneuver. Okay, uh, so but the issue there is you will have to remove the hand. Uh, to clean that area and give the injection unless you give the in injection through your palm. Okay. So remember that point also. So I, I prefer this method. Okay. Okay. Try this question. Okay. What is the answer? Okay. These are the answers. Piriformis is attached to the, it's not attached to the coccyx, it's attached to the bodies of the middle three pieces of the sacrum. 
and it is uh, posterior to the sacral plexus yes that's true pa i'll show you a diagram passes through the lesser sciatic foramen no it's through the greater sciatic foramen supplied by inferior gluteal no it's supplied by the sacral uh, branches not through inferior superior gluteal venous it's an abductor of the flexed thigh yes it's a lateral rotator of the extended thigh but an, uh, it abducts the flexed thigh okay so try to work it out okay check it on your body then uh, okay okay this is this diagram that i wanted to show you sacral plexus lies anterior to the piriformis muscle now if this is the piriformis muscle again you know you will only learn this when you do the pelvic cavity okay this is too early for you but i'll show you this this is the piriformis muscle uh, your greater sciatic foramen would be you know somewhere here okay it's coming through it okay um, sacral plexus of nerves lies anterior to the piriformis muscle like this on the posterior lateral wall of the pelvic cavity then covering the the sacral plexus is the uh, pelvic fascia parietal pelvic fascia it's also called piriformis fascia then further in front you get the ureter you know what is ureter ureter and the uh, the internal iliac vessels ureter and the internal iliac vessels so, okay this is just uh, just to show you uh, the relationship then structures okay try to answer this one structures passing through the greater sciatic foramen include uh, it's the piriformis muscle sciatic nerve posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh internal pudendal vessels superior gluteal nerve all are correct trendelenburg test is positive here i told you just now trendelenburg test or you can call it trendelenburg sign so what you test is the sign So A is false. It has it has got nothing to do with the tenoral bulk test. Gluteus maximus has got nothing to do with. Others are true. Superior gluteal nerve injury. Yes, all the abductors are paralyzed. Fracture of the greater trochanter. If there's avulsion fracture of the greater trochanter, all the abductors are attached. The distal attachment is to the greater trochanter. So even though the muscle and the nerves work, there is no point for them to act on. Okay. Then the dislocation of the hip. As I told you before, again the two points come closer to each other, so the muscles. Uh, does not have a leg to act on okay evulsion fracture occurs at so all bony points uh, if there are muscle attachments strong muscle attachments then evulsion fractures can take place just to you know just to show you, you know how it can happen okay strong muscle attachments when the muscles violently contract bony point can break popliteal fossa this morning a student asked about the contents of the popliteal fossa uh, you try to find you know all these contents and structures related uh, in your textbooks uh, if you go by a snail or gray's anatomy uh, you can be sure that you know in an mcq you will not be marked wrong but rather than you know trying to uh, trying to list things uh, like you know uh, the contents of the popliteal fossa contents of the femoral triangle and so on uh, learn the whole thing together okay so how the structures pass through it okay so or in all my descriptions I, I i i try to do that rather than giving you lists okay um, in a way you have to know from medial to lateral what are the structures there that is part of your anatomy knowledge but uh, but when you remember it uh, not don't remember it like a list okay remember the uh, 3d picture of it okay so when it comes to the popliteal fossa there are several structures in it you get the popliteal artery vein tibial nerve and uh, and laterally you get the common peroneal nerve uh, and uh, then you get lymph nodes popliteal lymph nodes there lymphatics could be entering it then the small saphenous vein uh, passes through the roof and enters the popliteal vein there and the relationship of the vein nerve and the artery is that uh, the artery is the deeper structure okay uh, if this is the deep this is the superficial uh, artery uh, then you get the vein and then the uh, nerve coming and join there uh, so why you get this relationship now uh, now in the in the femoral triangle on the anterior aspect of the thigh you remember the femoral vein lied medial to the femoral artery you get the vein and artery here their relationship was vein was on the medial side now when it comes to the popliteal fossa uh, vein becomes superficial to the artery now what happens is if you remember your embryology during development there is medial rotation of the 
globally. So with that rotation, what happens is when these structures pass through the adductor canal, they rotate, maintaining their relationship. Nowhere they cross each other. Okay, they don't cross each other. So what happens is uh, they are like this. They are like this. So when they rotate like that, the one that is on the medial side comes to lie uh, posterior to the other one. Posterior means superficial. Okay, so the artery that was on the lateral side becomes uh, becomes the deep one at the popliteal fossa. Uh, so nothing else. So it's very easy to remember. Don't try to remember when uh, and those things. You know, just just remember it like um, uh, you know based on the embryology thing. Okay. Then what happens is these two go like that, and the nerve comes from above. So branches of the sciatic nerve comes from above and just joins it. Okay. So nerve comes and just joins. So it again it doesn't cross these things. Okay. So it doesn't cross, so it cannot go deep. Okay, it just comes and uh, passes with them from uh, proximal to distal. Okay. So knee joint, you know that it is, uh, it is the largest synovial joint in the body. And it's a modified hinge joint, hinge joint, which is a compound joint. Okay. So why you call it a compound joint? Because there are several sub compartments in the joint. Now you have tibial condyles and femoral condyles. So you have a joint between the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibial condyle as well as the lateral femoral condyle and the lateral tibial condyle. So you have two compartments like this, uh, even though you know it's one joint. Then uh, in front of the joint, you have a uh, saddle joint between the patella and the femur. So if this is the distal end of the femur, okay, uh, you have a saddle joint here between the distal end of the femur and the uh, patella. Then the other thing is now this condylar joints here uh, again has an upper and lower compartments not very important. Now you have your menisci like this, menisci like this. Above the menisci you get the upper compartment which is the main compartment. Then within the meniscus here there is small area you get a lower compartment uh, in which you get the rotation. Okay. So you get uh, here, here referring to here in this part you get the rotation medial and lateral rotation is a very slight rotation so that is the movement that is important for locking and unlocking of the knee joint medial and lateral rotation uh, the flexion takes place in the upper joint okay so this whole area above that you get the flexion and extension uh, in that area both you know medial and lateral condyle joints uh, help in that okay and this uh, menisci medial and lateral menisci uh, are fibrocartilage discs. Are fibrocartilage discs. Okay. Uh, so this is hyaline cartilage. This is fibrocartilage covering the hyaline cartilage above. Okay. Blood supply and nerve supply. Uh, it's it's obvious that you know when there's an anastomosis around the knee joint. You get the blood supply from that anastomosis. You know, several vessels will supply it therefore. And, and the nerve supply, uh, femoral nerve, uh, sciatic nerve, and the obturator nerve, you know, all the all the all the nerves that supply the muscles that move the joint, or nerves that pass across the joint will supply the joint. Okay, that's how you get the nerve supply. Okay. Then uh, ligaments, uh, knee joint uh, is uh, is uh, you know the, the surfaces are very flat. Not like your shoulder joint or uh, 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 elbow joint, uh, shoulder joint or uh, hip joint. Okay, uh, and uh, it's a flat, it's a flat joint. So you need to have, you totally depend on ligaments to maintain it. Okay, so then uh, a fibrous capsule. You know some authors like Chaurasi, they take the fibrous capsule also as a ligament. Okay, so we put that also for the safety. And uh, and then you get the ligamentum patellae here, okay, ligamentum patellae, uh, and you get the tibial collateral ligament on this side, and the fibular collateral ligament. Uh, tibial collateral ligament is a little bit broad like that. Fibular one is like a cord, okay, it's a, like a cord. Then uh, posteriorly on the other side, you get the oblique popliteal uh, ligament, which is actually an uh, extension of the semimembranosus tendon oblique popliteal ligament. Then uh, these are the extracapsular ligament. Then intracapsular ligament, there are two intracapsular important ligaments, the cruciate ligaments and uh, uh, there's a transverse ligament. Cruciate ligaments are important, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. Okay. 
Then a few things about the, the cruciate ligaments. They are named anterior and posterior based on their attachment to the tibial plateau. Okay, so if your tibial plateau is like this, this anterior side, this posterior side, one that is attached anteriorly is called the anterior cruciate, one that is attached posteriorly is called the posterior cruciate ligament. Okay, so that's it. Uh, and this point is important. Okay, this point is clinically important. Posterior one is thicker, shorter and stronger and it's less oblique. Okay, since it is uh, thicker, shorter and stronger, obviously, when it comes to cruciate, uh, cruciate ligament injuries, anterior cruciate is more prone to damage than the posterior cruciate. Okay, so that's one point you need to remember. Uh, and uh, when it comes to attachments, uh, summarize here, cruciate ligaments are attached to the intercondylar area, anterior and posterior, as I mentioned before. Uh, and this, this is the attachment of the menisci. Okay, uh, these are the cruciate ligaments, anterior and posterior, and the green lines are menisci. Uh, and the anterior cruciate is attached to the lateral femoral condyle. Lateral femoral condyle, this is the lateral side. And the posterior cruciate is attached to the medial uh, femoral condyle. Uh, remember that point. Okay. When it comes to ligament injuries at the knee joint, remove this. Ligament injuries at the knee joint, this, this is the common uh, common nerves of ligament uh, and meniscal injuries, both, both ligament and meniscal injuries. Um, now, the medial collateral ligament uh, damage is more than, it's more common than lateral collateral ligament damage. Medial meniscal damage is uh, more common than the lateral meniscus damage. And the anterior cruciate ligament damage is more common than posterior cruciate ligament damage. So remember these three with anatomical basis, okay. Why medial collateral uh, ligament damage is more common than lateral collateral ligament damage? Why medial meniscus damage is more common than lateral meniscus damage? Why anterior cruciate ligament damage is more common than posterior cruciate ligament dam damage? I have already mentioned it, okay, because the posterior one is uh, thicker, stronger and shorter, okay. So why medial meniscus is more prone to injury? So we have asked this question several times in your, in your papers. Why medial meniscus is more prone to injury? Medial one, medial meniscus is attached to the medial collateral ligament. Okay. And it is not free to move therefore. Okay. On the other hand, lateral meniscus uh, is not attached to the lateral collateral ligament or the fibular collateral ligament. And the lateral meniscus is free to move during certain movements of the knee joint. And the other point is the lateral uh, meniscus is attached to the popliteus muscle. You know the popliteus muscle, it's a deep muscle in the posterior compartment of the leg. It is, uh, it is an important muscle that uh, laterally rotates the femur on the tibia before it can be uh, flexed after locking. Okay, it unlocks the uh, knee joint before it can flex. Now the popliteus is also attached to the lateral meniscus and when the popliteus contracts, lateral meniscus is pulled backwards. Since it is not attached to the lateral collateral ligament, okay, uh, it can be easily pulled out of danger uh, without getting crushed between the two lateral condyles, tibial and femoral lateral condyle. So this is the reason, you know, why the medial meniscus is more prone to damage, okay. Uh, that is one reason. Then you know, there's another reason. Now when it comes to injuries to the knee joint, uh, the knee joint is mainly uh, meant for flexion and extension uh, and if there is forced abduction or forced adduction then you will get these ligaments damaged. Now if you if you direct uh, if there's an impact from the lateral side outside uh, what happens is you get the the medial side uh, separation okay so rather than the lateral ligament if the injury is you know not uh, a massive injury you get the medial collateral ligament and the medial meniscus attached. So it's not only medial meniscus, uh, usually the medial collateral ligament or the uh, tibial collateral ligament and the medial meniscus is damaged and, and you can give the other reasons also. It's attached to this one, it cannot move and all. Okay. Then if you get uh, the, the force from the opposite direction, from this direction, then you get the lateral uh, collateral ligament uh, attached uh, in that injury. So, but the thing is, uh, all the common injuries are actually the force coming from the outside. Say if it is rugger, tuckling in, in rugger 
or maybe in the football players when one kicks he might you know accidentally kick the other person or one comes and there's an impact with another person the injuries are more common uh, from outside like this so then they are usually a forced abduction forced abduction injuries okay forced abduction injuries rather than forced adduction okay then you know any of these injuries whether it's forced abduction or adduction if the injury is severe uh, your internal structures like you know cruciate ligaments can get damaged and the anterior cruciate is more prone to get damaged but even the posterior and anterior both can get damaged if it is a severe um, injury okay uh, and these things happen in uh, netball players and all that okay and uh, when you want to look for the integrity of cruciate ligaments this is how you do it you get the person to lie down on a flat surface uh, and the femur the, the the femur here is uh, more or less stable it's fixed femur is fixed so if you pull if you pull in this direction then actually what you are looking for is the anterior cruciate ligament if there's movement in that direction you know that there is you know some issue with the anterior cruciate ligament on the on the side where you get the movement okay one side you might get but on the other side you might not get movement then if you want to do the opposite uh, you do the opposite you push it against the femur so if there's movement on that side you suspect um, posterior cruciate ligament damage okay then compartments of the leg uh, you know the compartments you get the anterior compartment you get the lateral compartment and the posterior compartment it is divided into a deep compartment and a superficial compartment by a transverse intermuscular septum uh, and you have an anterior intermuscular septum here and a posterior intermuscular septum and an introsis membrane and this transverse septum all these will divide the leg into tough compartments so if there's compartment syndrome as i explained in the previous lecture you might have to put a large incision and cut all this okay you might enter here sometimes and go that way cut this one cut this one and even this one with that one okay you might not be able to cut this okay to relieve pressure then the motor nerve territories i we have discussed this several times the anterior compartment the motor nerve is the deep peroneal nerve then the lateral compartment is the superficial peroneal nerve which are branches of the common peroneal nerve then the posterior compartment uh, nerve is the tibial uh, nerve and the muscles of these compartments and all that you learn with your dissections you have parallel dissections going on uh, in the sense you know dissection videos then when it comes to the skeleton of the foot mm, it's a lot of uh, variations compared to the, uh, the hand uh, now in the hand in the carpus you get uh, eight carpal bones uh, uh, then instead in the foot you get seven uh, tarsal bones okay so you get seven tarsal bones one less okay so there is calcaneus which is the uh, the weight bearing one direct weight bearing one then you get the talus on top of that then the cuboid is uh, attached to the calcaneus then to the talus attached to the navicular bone to the navicular you get uh, three cuneiform bones attached okay three cuneiform bones attached lateral medial and intermediate one okay then uh, uh, the, when it comes to the metatarsal five metatarsal bones uh, lateral two metatarsal bones are attached to the cuboid then the medial three attached to the uh, the three cuneiform bones then you get the uh, the phalanges uh, two and others all uh, three three okay uh, two three 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 then uh, so this is about the structure of the foot uh, now don't uh, don't give less attention to the foot even the teachers give less attention to the foot uh, it's arches structures maintaining the arches muscles uh, don't give uh, less attention even since you're learning anatomy uh, you have to learn it properly you can be questioned okay you can be questioned you know uh, I'm, I'm fond of questioning on the foot area um, so just because you don't know much uh, you cannot get away with it then a uh, few things about the ankle joint it's a synovial hinge type joint uh, and you can do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion um, at the ankle joint okay now the dorsiflexion is limited by the uh, this one you know dorsiflexion is limited by the broad anterior end of the talus okay broad anterior end of the talus this end is uh, less 
wide. Okay. Uh, so dorsiflexion. So it's if you compare the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, plantar flexion is almost double uh, dorsiflexion. Okay, ten and twenty roughly. But uh, towards the extreme end of um, um, dorsiflexion, you get uh, apparent eversion of the foot. You can do it and at home and check it. At the extreme end of the dorsiflexion, you get uh, apparent uh, eversion of the foot. Okay, and uh, at the extreme uh, plantar flexion, you get apparent inversion of the foot. But these are not true uh, eversions and inversions. Okay, true eversion and inversion takes place at the tarsal joints, not at the uh, synovial uh, joint, uh, not at the ankle joint. Okay, so it's only apparent. So this is the point that I mentioned true inversion and eversion at the tarsal joints okay now a few things about the tarsal joints even though there are several tarsal joints uh, the important tarsal joints uh, that are especially important for eversion and inversion are these tarsal joints okay? uh, tarsal joints between the talus calcaneus um, navicular and the cuboid these main four bones the proximal bones are the ones that are they form important uh, tarsal joints now, if I summarize the tarsal joints, there are uh, two tarsal. There are two joints under the talus. Under the talus, you get two joints. One is talocalcanean joint. Talocalcanean. Talocalcanean. Okay, between the talus and the calcaneus. Okay. Then the second one is talocalcanean navicular. It's talocalcanean navicular. So it's between three bones. Okay, talocalcanean navicular joint. Okay. Now then there is a third one between the calcaneus and the cuboid, which is called the calcaneo cuboid joint. Green one. Calcaneo cuboid joints. Now these are the main joints that are involved in inversion and eversion of the foot. Now uh, some authors uh, they want to make it more simple. What they do is they do something like this. Okay. Now see what, what happens. Okay. So they describe two joints. One is subtalar joint, subtalar joint, which uh, which includes talocalcanean joint plus the posterior part of the talocalcanean navicular joint, which is between the talus and the calcaneus. Okay, and call it subtalar joint. Okay, and then they combine the uh, calcaneo cuboid joint, this one, with the talonavicular part of the talocalcanean navicular joint remaining part from this part okay and they call it mid tarsal joint okay so you get ultimately you get uh, instead of three joints instead of three joints you get two joints subtalar joint and the mid tarsal joint which is very easy to use i i like it okay uh, so but you know the principle behind this okay so the inversion and inversion takes place in these joint mid tarsal joint and subtalar joints if you want then a few points about the attachment uh, of uh, uh, tendons uh, and ligaments. Uh, now one point uh, that I like you to remember is that uh, this one. You take the base of the first uh, metatarsal bone, metatarsal bone, tibialis anterior. <coughs> tibialis anterior is attached to the base of the first metatarsal uh, bone. This is tibialis anterior. Okay, remember that point. That is from the uh, the superior or you know medial side. Then this is the tendon of the peroneus longus. Now that comes from the lateral side because it's a lateral muscle. Comes under the foot, all the way across the foot, and again gets attached to the base of the first metatarsal bone. Now tibialis anterior was attached from that side. So remember that if both these contract, the muscles contract and there's tension in the tendons. This will act as a complete, you know, one sling, uh, which can, you know, raise the foot. Okay, can raise the foot. Otherwise, if only this one is acting, it tends to pull this down. Okay, you can imagine, you know, what happens. Okay, if it is not pulled by the tibialis anterior from the other side. Okay. So then, uh, other point is uh, peroneus. This is peroneus longus. Peroneus brevis, on the other hand. It does not cross the foot, it's attached to the base of the uh, fifth metatarsal bone. That is, these two points you have to remember. There is the other thing, tibialis posterior, this one, it actually attached to many bones in that area. It binds all these uh, tarsal bones together 
uh, it's the, the few boards that it is not attached to are the tailors because it's too high and the first meta tassel and the fifth meta tassel boards okay it, it still slips to all the other boards and and keeps the bones together okay they bind the bones together it binds the bones together then another point here uh, the the ligaments of the ankle joint uh, there are two ligaments medial ligament and the lateral ligament of the ankle medial ligament is called deltoid ligament okay medial ligament is called deltoid ligament remember that name and uh, it is the stronger of the two um, ligaments and uh, the medial ligament or the deltoid ligament has four separate bands I don't uh, think you have to remember these separate bands, but there's a deep part. Remember at this, that one, there's a deep and superficial components. Okay. So there are four components and some are deep, some are superficial. Uh, and therefore, this is the stronger ligament and it's less likely to break. Okay. On the other hand, the lateral uh, ankle ligament, uh, it does not have a separate name. You call it lateral ligament. It has only three separate bands, which are very weak bands. You can see anterior tail of fibula, posterior tail of fibula and uh, calcaneo fibula ligaments they are very weak ligaments relative, relatively weak ligaments so so they are more prone to damage than the medial ligament and when it comes to accidental you know eversion and inversion when you step on something you know accidentally when you're walking on a, a, on a on an uneven ground uh, you can check this for yourself especially if you are wearing high heels and all uh, the it more likely uh, more likely movement is inversion rather than eversion okay so because if you lift the foot you will see that foot tends to get inverted than inverted in the normal if you just hang the foot okay lift your leg and hang the foot let it hang it gets a little bit inverted so this thing uh, acts here the moment you get inverted uh, the moment the ankle gets inverted it's the lateral ligament that gets damaged like you know it's like you know forced abduction and adduction of the uh, uh, knee joint okay so so the, the the area where it gets stretched the ligament tears okay so when it comes to ankle sprains ankle sprains uh, you call ankle sprains where the ligaments are damaged when it comes to ankle sprains uh, lateral sprain is more uh, common than the medial ankle sprain uh, the reason is excessive inversion of the foot with plant flexion of the ankle uh, and it's usually the anterior two bands of the three uh, uh, three bands of the lateral ligament that are broken, the anterior tail of fibula one and the calcaneo fibula uh, rather than the posterior tail of fibula that is broken or you know partially torn. Uh, and the medial ligament is less likely to damage and the medial ligament is so strong that uh, when it is damaged uh, you have to suspect uh, the fracture of the medial malleolus. Okay, so tip of the medial malleolus uh, where the ligament is attached, attached can can be can get pulled off okay so in x-rays you should look for it because uh, it's the ligament is very strong it's like a coracoclavicular ligament and the clavicle in the upper leg okay so the ligament is more stronger than the clavicle they are also okay then uh, ligaments in the in the sole of the foot i am not going to discuss the muscles here that will uh, lengthen the lecture so you will be doing the muscles i think today you have a practical uh, this evening and maybe tomorrow also so you will study the practical the the, uh, the muscles there. Few things about the ligament. I have two lateral ligaments, uh, long plantar ligament and the short plantar ligament, which are both attached between the calcaneus and the cuboid. Okay, they are calcaneo cuboid ligaments. Then uh, there is a, um, uh, another ligament on the medial side, which is called calcaneo navicular ligament. Calcaneo navicular ligament from the sustentriculum tail of the calcaneus to the, uh, the the navicular bone which is a medial ligament now when it comes to foot arches okay you know the foot arches uh, these ligaments short and long plantar ligaments help to maintain the lateral foot arches and the spring ligament or the calcaneo navicular ligament helps to maintain the medial foot uh, arches longitudinal arches okay okay this is about the foot arches so the different authors you know describe uh, different uh, ways especially when it comes to transverse arches medial and lateral ones of course the same and now a uh, few things to remember uh, all arches uh, usually they have if it is a complete arch uh, it should have two pillars okay on either side then you get the arch like this okay if you don't have one pillar then you will get a half arch okay because you don't have the other pillar okay so that 
fix it like this okay so then when it comes to uh, longitudinal there are two longitudinal arches medial and lateral longitudinal arch in both arches the the posterior pillar is the calcareous it's the same okay both pillars uh, the po both arches posterior pillar is calcareous then uh, the anterior pillars uh, for the lateral arch it is the, mm, the the heads of the two lateral uh, metatarsal bones when it comes to the medial arch is the head heads of the three medial metatarsal bones then the other bones they contribute now for the lateral one it is the calcaneus cuboid and the, the these two metatarsals up to the head then for the medial arch again the calcaneus talus uh, navicular the three cuneiforms and the three medial metatarsal bones when it comes to transverse arch uh, this is the point you know this is the area where different books have different opinions either you can describe only one transverse arch okay which is here okay or you can have another transverse arch in front which is a complete one this is complete one this is incomplete one because the the anterior one it's complete because it has the medial and lateral pillars medial and lateral pillars uh, the lateral one the, the head of the fifth uh, metatarsal bone medial one the head of the first metatarsal bone now the incomplete one the posterior arch um, is formed by the the bases of the five metatarsal bones cuboid and the, the cuneiform bones here uh, so this one actually uh, touches the flow so the lateral pillar is there but there's no medial pillar so you get a, if this is the lateral pillar you get a half arch like this if you put both feet together okay then you get the arch getting completed okay uh, so left and right both feet together now this is why you know when you when you have a footprint you get this you know uh, defect in the footprint okay uh, it's like this okay um, And these foot arches are maintained in that way uh, by various mechanisms. Uh, okay, now, uh, so this, these principles, maybe in Snell, you get this picture. You, you read this area and try to get, you know, familiar with all these mechanisms. Uh, now, one thing is the wedge-shaped, uh, you know, keystones. Wedge-shaped wedge keystones, this one. Uh, so you get, you know, a good example is the, the tailors lying on calcaneus, uh, the substanticulum tali and all. So because of the wedge shape, uh, the surrounding bones, then they are bound together by other mechanisms. They don't prevent the keystone dropping down. Okay. Then um, tight inferior stones, you know, it's like staplering. Okay, staplering. Because you get all these ligaments, uh, long plantar ligament, short plantar ligament, uh, spring ligament, and like the, the, the slips of the tendon of the tibialis posterior, they all bind these bones together. Okay. Uh, it's like stapling the stones underneath and the use of tie beams so here you know i said there are two pillars to an arch anterior and posterior or lateral and medial if there are structures that bind the two pillars then it helps to maintain the arch now when it comes to longitudinal arches long uh, the ligaments of uh, the tendons of long flexors like uh, flexor hallucis longus flexor digitorum longus passing behind the medial malleolus and going in front they actually help Plus, you get um, plantar aponeurosis here. You get flexor digitorum brevis muscle attached between the two pillars and helping to maintain both lateral and uh, medial uh, longitudinal uh, arches. So this one, of course, mainly the medial longitudinal arch. If it is a lateral one, uh, it will maintain the lateral longitudinal arch. Okay. Then uh, things like you know peroneus longus, maybe with the help of the tibialis anterior here it's like a suspension okay so it's like a suspension here uh, it it keeps the um, top edge in that position okay because it passes under the foot uh, i always like to add the tibialis anterior here otherwise you know this action will depress the medial arch okay while uh, pulling the lateral uh, longitudinal arch okay.